Well, good morning, everybody, and sorry for the delay in getting started this morning. Um, Dinastalin, and welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace for our continuing series, uh, Changing Ethiopia. You can also follow the discussion online with that uh, hashtag. My name is Ali Vergi, and I'm a senior advisor to the Africa program here at the Institute. Um, we've had a few small changes this morning, um, for which I apologize. Unfortunately, as a victim of the strong winds across the Atlantic, our uh, two speakers coming in from Ethiopia are not yet here. They're at Dulles and they're on their way, but we're going to start the conversation uh, with uh, the speakers that we do have uh, and integrate them when they, when they arrive. A few words of introduction about the Institute um, before we turn to today's panel. Uh, for the benefit of those of you who haven't been here before, as well as uh, our audience online. The U.S. Institute of Peace is a national, uh, nonpartisan, independent institute founded by the U.S. Congress in 1984 and dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible, practical, and essential for U.S. and global security. And today we're delighted to host a discussion about one of those countries pivotal to global security, particularly in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, uh, to discuss in particular the philosophy and the ideas that have emerged uh, from Ethiopia's still relatively new Prime Minister, Dr. Abiy Ahmed, uh, this most recent recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Medemer, this is the name of this philosophy, but what is Medemer? What does it mean? What does it not mean as well, perhaps? What are its principles? And what are their implications both for Ethiopia and beyond? Is it a new idea? Is it a path to sustained reform or merely a catchy slogan? To discuss some of these questions as well as the broader bilateral relationship uh, between US and Ethiopia, I'm joined today by uh, a couple of uh, eminent panelists, and I'll introduce who we do have at the moment and come back to um, our later guests when they arrive. Etana Dinka, um, our discussant today to offer uh, some critical reflections, is visiting assistant professor of African history and Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Oberlin College in Ohio. He is the author of Society, Revolution, and Military Intervention in Ethiopian Politics, experiences among the Maka Oromo of Walaga from 1974 to 1991. And his research interests include the political history of Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. We also have, um, as our DC uh, representative here, um, Ethiopia's ambassador to the United States, uh, who will make some opening remarks and then we'll kick off the conversation, uh, who has been uh, ambassador now just for nine months, he was telling me. Um, previously, he served as uh, Director General of the Ethiopian Investment Commission, head of the Addis Ababa Investment Agency, and as Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's first Chief of Staff uh, from April to December 2018. So please join me in welcoming our panelists and Ambassador, um, some opening remarks from you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm checking if there are people in the room. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very honored to be here with you this morning among uh, this August assembly. Before I start my remarks, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the U.S. Peace Institute for organizing this timely event to discuss Medemer, the new philosophy introduced by Ethiopian Prime Minister and Nobel Peace Laureate, Dr. Abiy Ahmed. Thank you very much. As most of you know, immediately after taking office in April 2018, Prime Minister Abiy initiated unprecedented political and economic reform measures that have completely changed Ethiopia's political landscape and put our country on a new trajectory of social and economic transformation. His achievements have been duly recognized not only at home, but also internationally with the honor of receiving the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize. Some of the major reforms 
undertaken in the past few months include the following. Immediately after taking office, the new administration lifted the country's terror of emergency and released thousands of political prisoners. The terrorist designation of exiled opposition political groups was removed and they were invited to return home to participate in the political process. Media censorship was discontinued and several repressive laws have been revised to build a more transparent, accountable and democratic governance. Ethiopia now has a gender balanced cabinet, a female president and Supreme Court, Supreme Court Chief Justice, among other high level appointments, significantly increasing the influence of women in the country's political and public life. The Prime Minister took the courageous initiative to resolve the border conflict with Eritrea, ending the 20 year no war, no peace stalemate between the two countries. Furthermore, his effective mediation of conflicts between Eritrea and Djibouti, between Kenya and Somalia, as well as in Sudan, South Sudan, and beyond, inspired a new hope of stabilizing and integrating the Horn of Africa and the continent at large. In the economic front, the government has introduced a series of reforms to open up and transform the economy from state driven development towards greater participation of the private sector. Accordingly, the government has initiated an ambitious homegrown economic reform program with the aim of ensuring rapid economic growth, generating employment opportunities, especially for the youth and women, and creating an inclusive pathway to prosperity for all. A national ease of doing business initiative is being implemented with the aim of improving the business climate eliminating bureaucratic red tape and creating a predictable and transparent regulatory framework. A new investment proclamation is recently approved by the parliament to modernize the investment regulatory framework and encourage private sector participation in foreign investment in several sectors of the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, getting back to the main theme of today's forum, understanding Medemer, the organizers wonder whether this new political philosophy can remake Ethiopia and they formed, they framed three important questions for discussion. One, what are the key principles of Medemer and how can they be applied both domestically and abroad? Two, how does Medemer link with existing Ethiopian political and social structure? And three, is Medemer a path to sustain reform or merely a political slogan? As this question will be addressed by the distinguished panel of experts, including senior advisors from the Office of the Prime Minister, I will not dwell on the details here. However, I will try to highlight some of the core aspects of Medemer to provide a general framework for our discussion. In explaining the philosophy of Medemer during his Nobel Peace Prize, acceptance speech, Prime Minister Abiy has noted that Medemer is a homegrown idea that is reflected in our political, social and economic life. It signifies synergy, convergence and teamwork for a common destiny. The Prime Minister envisioned Medemer as a social compact for Ethiopians to build a just democratic and humane society by pulling together our resources for our collective survival and prosperity. He said at its core, Medemer is a covenant of peace that seeks unity in our common humanity. It pursues peace by practicing the value of love, forgiveness and reconciliation. Beyond the, beyond the broader Ethiopia's Medemer inspired foreign policy pursues peace through bilateral and multilateral cooperation and good neighborhoodliness. The inclusiveness of Medemer ensures no one is left behind and we strive to live with our neighbors in peace and harmony. To further elaborate the concept, I would like to share with you some insightful reviews by a prominent scholar here in the US, Professor Al-Mariam, who, who has written extensively on Medemer 
over the past months. In his recent Ademir book review, Professor Almaram wrote, in the dynamic process of cooperation and competition, Medema represents a synergetic process of coming together of individuals, groups, leaders, and institutions to work more energetically and effectively for the common good in the public interest. The synergy uses the synergy using a, a physics metaphor would be like fusion in which nuclear combined to release vast amount of energy when individuals, groups, institutions, etc., etc., coming together in Medemer form, they release a vast amount of social, political, and economic synergy. This Medemer as synergetic collaboration for the task of nation building and collaborative progress aims to harness the aspiration of individuals and unleash their energies for the collective good. Thus, from the above brief review, we can understand that Medemer is not just a political philosophy or a mere political slogan. It's rather a ground vision, a grand vision that encompasses the political, cultural, economic, and social fabrics of the society. Although we still have a long way to go, the achievements gained so far by the political and economic reform undertaken within the short period of time are both exceptional and are commendable by any standard. We understand that these deep-rooted reform measures take time and require patience. We also recognize that the journey will not be smooth and there will be bumps in the road that will challenge us to derail the reforms as we have already started the preparations to hold the general election in a few months. The challenge ahead of us could be even more daunting. However, the Ethiopian government is fully committed to stay the course and ensure that the upcoming election is free, fair, and transparent. Let me conclude by, my, by emphasizing that in order to ensure that the reform measures are sustained, they require the participation of all stakeholders, political parties, civil society organizations, and the public at large, each and every one of us. I'm confident that all of us make positive contributions towards the peace building and democratization process in the spirit of Medemer. The political and economic reforms will create new opportunities for Ethiopian people to build a democratic, peaceful, and prosperous society. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks, and thank you for joining us today. Um, maybe we can start where you left off, just to begin the conversation and come back to Medema in a moment. But you talked about reforms. And for those of us who've been watching Ethiopia since Prime Minister Abiy came into power and witnessing the changes, observing the many accomplishments that have occurred in a fairly short period of time, one question that I have for you um, is to hear a little bit more about what reforms do you feel are most important now. When we talk about reforms, and you talked about political reforms, economic reforms, we could also mention security reforms. The danger is that it's a seemingly endless list. And I think it would be useful and interesting for us to try and understand more about what the priorities are. If we talk about now, early 2020, you mentioned the elections are upcoming later this year. What are the reforms that are both necessary now in 2020, achievable now, realistic now, and what are the priorities for, for the government when we talk about reform? What does this mean, practically speaking? Thank you. Uh, the whole... Uh, concept of uh, reform is why the reform was needed. Uh, before uh, Prime Minister Abe came to power, as you, most of you remember, there were a uh, large number of youths needing a reform, pushing for change. And uh, 
that built up over a long period of years. And uh, uh, basically, uh, if you see uh, what happened before the Prime Minister Abi came to power, there were, uh, in terms of economic progress, there were uh, fast growth, mainly fueled by public investment, investment in uh, infrastructure, and uh, mainly by state-owned enterprises. Banks were not uh, providing any resources or uh, enough resources for the private sector, uh, and uh, the private sector in every sector were not able to compete easily with uh, government or uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, so because of that, there were uh, feelings of um, non-inclusive approach for economic, uh, as well as when you come to the political process, the parliament that is still uh, working at the moment is 100% uh, controlled by the governing party, uh, which uh, has created a sense of um, alienation or people want to be inclusive. So the whole the reform is both political, uh, economic, uh, has been uh, the need for inclusiveness. Sure, but what, are, but what are the priorities? Because when you mention the parliament, Yes, you're right, it is, as you say, 100% held by the governing party. That isn't going to change tomorrow. That may change with elections whenever those are held. But what, what are the priorities that the government can do now? You can't change the composition of the parliament, right? It, that's going to remain more or less unchanged. So what, when you talk about economic reforms, for example, what are the things that the government can do um, in the near term? Okay, as I explained earlier on my uh, opening remark, uh, I'll come to the political, the economic part, but in the economy and the political part, to allow uh, citizens to participate directly or uh, through whomever you know they are represented by opposition parties, yeah. to or uh, to express their uh, 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 their views, uh, to allow freedom of speech uh, and also freedoms of uh, expression. Uh, which is already uh, on, the con on the constitution, but was not practiced. So there were also laws that prevented uh, practically the expression that was enshrined in the constitution. So uh, uh, removing, uh, changing, uh, and enacting new ones uh, has been a priority, and that has been already done and will continue to be. So that's part of the a democratization process, political process. So if I can ask uh, you on yes, that, then, okay. then, then what, because it, as you said, it has been done. I mean, parties, opposition parties are now able to function. There is greater freedom of um, expression, media, and so on. So what remains to be done? What still can be done now? So that is just opening up. Uh, one of the problems, as I said, was lack of inclusiveness. Yeah. And the political uh, parties that descend that has uh, different views. Some of them were uh, labeled as terrorists, uh, exiled or imprisoned. Some of them life for life or uh, death sentence. All were uh, given amnesty. All were uh, given, uh, you know, another chance to not only be free but also participate in a political, f you know process in that they are now participating. So um, that part has been already done. Yeah. And with the remaining periods, there are things that will be done uh, in consultation with uh, the uh, participants uh, in the political process. Uh, in the economic sphere, uh, the main or the core for the reform has been homegrown economic reform program which is basically um, reviews what went wrong mm -hmm. and found out that public has crowded in uh, and private sector was not supported. So uh, the theme is just to encourage private, par uh, private sector participation uh, by way of first one is not maybe the main one, but 
privatization, partial privatization is part of it, but the challenge is not only um, few public uh, ownership, but also uh, there are challenges in the macro arrangement where uh, you have huge foreign currency shortages, uh, the exchange rail, uh, uh, the exchange uh, rate control, or the the foreign currency policy, the trade policy, all that has be, that has to be reviewed in pursuit of supporting the private sector and accelerating the growth. So, uh, to do that, we needed, uh, I mean, to look into uh, the the areas that need. Uh, change, one of which is uh, to improve the ease of doing business. Uh, the business climate uh, was not as supportive as it should be, uh, especially at the, we have two regimes, one is supporting the FDI, which relatively was uh, friendly, but still when it comes to access to land, power, or contract enforcement, uh, or um, Related, you know, the ease of doing things, tax uh, collection, uh, and uh, liquidation uh, even. There were so many challenges in it. So the reform includes easing all those uh, parameters. Import-export policy, accessing foreign currency uh, for inputs uh, as well as uh, for other purposes to run the business has been a challenge. So... Uh, reducing the import-export uh, time as well as cost so that companies operating, be it FDI or locals, be more competitive in a global uh, sphere. That was also another area that has been touched on. Uh, also, acceding, acceding to WTO has also been considered. After eight years, as part of this reform, uh, the first meeting has been commenced uh, two weeks ago, so um, uh, you, you, you see uh, when, it, when it comes to public investment that, w that were designated as public investment now are open to PPP for the first time. We have at the moment uh, more than nine billion US dollars worth uh, public private participation projects already uh, identified and uh, available for participation road projects, uh, power projects, uh, and also other uh, areas. Um, and um, when it comes to public, I mean, privatization, um, sugar industries are ready for full privatization. Um, and uh, ETO Telecom, uh, which is the biggest uh, in terms of mobile subscription in, the, in Africa, even bigger than big operators, but when it comes to uh, internet and uh, digital services, one of the poorest, uh, is also uh, open for partial privatization uh, in order to create efficiency uh, and competition and will be implemented through transparent process. We are not here to uh, transfer uh, the asset to a private sector and create private monopoly. Mm -hmm. Here we are trying to bring more efficiency through uh, new technology and uh, expanding the service in areas that are highly needed, which is uh, access to internet. Mm -hmm. uh, when the use gets uh, connected to the internet, they will be uh, liberated to connect to the rest of the world and uh, companies who want to do uh, outsourcing businesses uh, and other, you know, uh, related to IT sectors will be highly encouraged to yeah. uh, do uh, that uh, business as well. So this will open up uh, for uh, the only not only in telecom, but also power is also ready for partial privatization. Yeah. Uh, and uh, PPP is also uh, available. Um, all, all, all arrangements are also there. Uh, railways. Uh, for the first time, logistics sector has been opened. For it has been liberalized for private sector, and also uh, is ready for privatization and joint venture. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, Ambassador, maybe we can come back to some of the many details you raised in a moment, particularly this idea of a homegrown reform plan, because I think a lot of us would recognize when you talk about privatization and more investment and so on, that this isn't necessarily a unique approach. It's certainly something that's happened in a lot of countries. But I want to bring Etana Dinka into the conversation first uh, for a moment to ask you the question about reform from the vantage point of 2020, February, what reforms are necessary in Ethiopia? You've heard what the ambassador has to say uh, in terms of both political reforms and economic reforms. What is your opinion on what Ethiopia needs in terms of reforms at the present time? Thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity. Um, now, since uh, every political group, every civic organization, and in fact, the entire country uh, agreed that Ethiopia got into reform. We are not now in the second year. Um, like the ambassador enumerated earlier, um, peace was made with Eritrea, prisoners were released, exiled political parties went home. Uh, so all of this uh, happened since April 2018, and no one will be bent to uh, challenge that because it's a positive move uh, toward this democratization process. But after 2018, as soon as the new Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, came to power, Ethiopia is not doing well, and the main agenda is not about reform. The main agenda of Abiy's government is to lay a ground, build a foundation upon which Abiy will stay on power for long. So what reforms are needed then? I mean, um, if you don't think yeah. reforms are occurring, what are the reforms that are needed? The reforms needed for me are many in terms of politics, economy, and even uh, within the society itself, um, including the issues of media. But the first step Ethiopia needs to do to get into a real reform, there is one priority. Unless that priority, priority is filled, Ethiopia cannot get into a real reform because there is a major obstacle on, on the way of um, the reform. That is the prime minister Abi himself. So what, so what is that one thing that needs to happen, that one priority? The removal of Abiy Ahmed from office. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I see that as a reform exactly, but I, I want to ask you, to press you a bit more on what is the reform that is needed? If Ethiopia is not experiencing enough reform in your view, what reforms are needed? Thank you very much. So once we talk about um, this issue, if we agree that Abiy is a problem, not part of a solution, because since he came to office in the name of democratization, in the name of reform, lots of damages have been done to the country's institutions, including um, the defense forces and every institution that the country has. So the reform we need is to open a space equally for the opposition and for uh, the governing party right now. The opposition has a freedom to work to some extent, which we cannot deny, yeah. in major urban centers. Yeah. In rural Ethiopia today, hundreds of opposition supporters are getting into, uh, being taken into prison. Citizens are slain, killed in broad daylight in the western provinces of the country, as I am talking right now. Citizens are being dragged out of home, being killed. Three provinces in the western part of the country are cut off from internet, from telephone, the country's national army are dragging youth from home, killing farmers on their own farms. In the southern part of the country, in Gucci province, citizens are taken into prison for no reason. Totally, the political space has not been open the way it has been um, promised. Mm -hmm. There is no equal opportunity given to the opposition and to the governing political party. In fact, the governing political party is hijacking every government institution, every government structure to promote its own ideal, which is a return into imperial Ethiopia in disguise. Okay. Um, Ambassador, let's come back to you. There are some fairly serious things that were said there. But what I want to, what I want to, serious things that were said, um, if we can please allow the discussion to occur. I want to ask you, Ambassador, in terms of the political space that exists, I think you yourself 
accepted in your opening remarks that there are still things to be done, and that's why I asked you what you saw as the priorities now. In terms of the political space, let's begin with political parties. Is the situation one which can be improved? How can this happen in the time that remains before elections? We know that there isn't a lot of time if the calendar announced by the National Electoral Board of Ethiopia uh, basically holds. We'll have elections in August of this year. It's just a few months away. What can be done to increase the political space or what are the plans of the government to increase the political space for opposition parties, for other parties, particularly during an election campaign. Thank you so much. Uh, just to reflect you know, a few issues on what uh, uh, Itana... Well, maybe we'll come to those in a moment, but okay. if you could address the qu my question, that would be great. So what things to be done? On the political space in particular. Yeah. Right, okay. If I understood your question correctly, uh, I mean, the government uh, has been... Uh, doing all its best to ensure there is peace and stability in the country. But given the previous uh, government uh, security uh, you know, apparatus, mm -hmm. uh, the way uh, human rights has been, you know, was abused, uh, and changing that with a new uh, set of attitude and uh, Equipping that uh, definitely will take time. Yeah. So if we see, I mean, if we uh, see the principles I just mentioned earlier, um, if we see the you know the history of Ethiopia in the past forty or more years, uh, there were mistrust and uh, there were also uh, ideas that were brought from uh, either east. Uh, socialist attitude and uh, principles and uh, from West just uh, taking it as it is without adapting. This is the first time that um, we are now um, having uh, a homegrown and also uh, what I can say is just uh, um, what's exactly uh, assessing the Ethiopian situation on the ground. So um, what we were lacking is if we have to accuse each other, nobody can be uh, clean. That's why it starts with forgiveness. As something, you know, I it looks like some religious kind of uh, metaphor, but if we have to count, there are so many issues everyone has committed. Um, we cannot uh, escape from that. But we have to start afresh. So what Prime Minister Abiy is saying is that let's start fresh, no uh, pointing fingers. We can, uh, you know, one can blame the other with tangible uh, issues. So forgiveness will take us forward. Let's cooperate from now on. That's the best, I mean. Uh, so uh, with that, if, if we work with that spirit, the future is in our hand. We cannot control the past. Uh, so let's work on you know, where we are now uh, so that we write our own history. Uh, there are uh, histories that are still controlling us. For example, there are identity politics uh, ethnic politics, religious politics. Uh, so people have to come with ideas which can convince people. What are the policies that we are bringing to people? Mm -hmm. uh, what are we going to do to change the lives of the people? Uh, let's discuss on ideals, yeah. not on identity. So when we do that, I think the real debate comes into picture. Well, when you talk about forgiveness, you're touching um, specifically on the philosophy of, of Medimer, so let's perhaps go there in a moment. But I do want to ask you to respond to what Atana referenced in terms of the fact that there have been clashes. This is not um, something that is secret. There have been clashes in parts of Ethiopia in recent times over the last 
couple of years. What, in your view, can the government do about it? What do you say to the accusation that the, the army or um, state forces have been participating or complicit in some of the uh, violations that have occurred? What, what is the government's response to that? Uh, first of all, when, uh, I mean, before this thing happened, I mean, the, before the change happened, uh, it's important how it happened. Mm. Uh, how it's important to see how it happened. Uh, so, uh, the former Prime Minister, uh, Haile Maria, yes, has resigned, yes. mainly uh, because of the pressure, the mounting pressure, and also... Uh, the pressure coming from the party. So there were internal fight, external fight. Yeah. And uh, I think we have to uh, appreciate the step he has taken in Africa. He resigned himself sure. despite the pressure. I mean, th there were pressures. Uh, he understood that, you know, where that is going to lead. But he chose to uh, resign. So there there were two kinds of, two sets of uh, thoughts as to how to continue. Yeah. The first one was, uh, despite the challenges in the previous electoral process, there was a law. There were views from uh, political parties, uh, opposition parties, some of whom were uh, armed, and they, were, you know, they think, they thought, um, they can influence, uh, and they were asking for uh, a transitional government. Uh, so that, that, that was one of the options. I'm not saying that wasn't possible. The other course was to complete the term that was given by the constitution to the previous prime minister and then prepare uh, for elections. For elections. Right. So after a thorough debate, I think this course has been taken. Yeah. Uh, so there are people uh, opposing political parties that still believe uh, the first course of action should have been taken, and still they believe now mm -hmm. we need to have that. So they see themselves fit into this uh, process yeah. and want a new um, transitional government and reforming starting from the constitution, but we believe that that will bring mounting task which we cannot you know, uh, easily uh, handle for a population of 110 million, mm -hmm. uh, where there are ethnic as well as the religious conflicts uh, are, you know, um, you can feel it everywhere. So um, this is a kind of, you know, uh, a political, uh, consultation that has led us to where we are now. Okay, thank yeah. you for that. But I don't think that entirely responds to the question of what has happened since Prime Minister Abiy has come into office in terms of some of the violence that has occurred in the country, some of the displacement that has occurred in the country. Uh, Ethiopia has now a very high number of internally displaced uh, persons as a result of some of these subnational conflicts. What do you say to the allegation that the government has, or the government forces or the army have participated, maybe not in all cases, but in some cases to either participate in these violations or um, otherwise uh, not prevent them from occurring. I mean, what is the government's response to that in terms of what's happening now and last year and not uh, necessarily when Haile Marim was prime minister? I understand. So uh, what happened is a continuation of uh, what was uh, prepared and uh, uh, before, um, I mean, the new prime minister came to power. But now, uh, when different parties joined uh, for a peaceful political process, all of them were not denouncing violence. Some of them uh, continued with their uh, way of. Uh, you know, uh, looking, I mean, uh, looking forward to power. Uh, some of them who were in neighboring countries armed, uh, when invited, there was a condition to denounce violence 
and also be unarmed. Uh, they did that when they joined, uh, but partly what you see in parts of the country uh, is as a result of not honoring uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, covenant they just uh, took before they decided to join. Uh, but I don't want to take this uh, blame to all. Sure. Uh, but also there were also uh, security reform mm -hmm. that, uh, I mean, dysfunctioned some of the security that were accused because of human, I mean, human, uh, I mean, uh, because of, uh, I was going to say, abuses, mm -hmm. uh, there were, uh, in the security realm, there were uh, important, but were not aligned to the new change. Yeah. Uh, so they were very important for securing the previous arrangement, yes. but were not helpful for the new one, yes. taking change, this has taken some time. Okay. Uh, that was also another thing that needed uh, adjustment. So what you hear from people is two views. Yeah. At one hand, you hear there are conflicts in these parts. Government is putting heavy hand. Mm -hmm. In the other hand, government is not doing enough mm -hmm. to secure peace and stability in the country. Yes. So government has been trying with the new philosophy first teaching, then enforcing rule of okay. law. Uh, so in the, in the process, uh, it's unfortunate. There are, yes, uh, loss of life yeah. uh, and also uh, so many uh, you know, damages. Uh, I think the opposition party, uh, all politicians in the country have a role to call for peace and for, for peaceful process. Okay. So, so I just want to be clear so that for the benefit of the audience and also for um, anybody that will be watching this later, you were saying that you hold at least some opposition groups somewhat responsible for some of the things that have occurred without going into every individual issue and area because Ethiopia is a very large and diverse country. But as the representative of your government, you're also saying that the government accepts some responsibility for... Uh, some of the violations that have occurred. Is that accurate? Is that a fair uh, summary? So, uh, as you can see, we are in a making of uh, inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, so, government is trying now not to blame one party yes. over the other and make it a clear line like that, but definitely uh, they know it themselves, yeah. those who are uh, destabilizing. And time has been given for them to come back to their mind sure. and choose a better, inclusive way of working together. B in the meantime, yeah. those who are uh, in direct contact with the violation of mm -hmm. human rights or uh, you know, the perpetrators are brought to justice. Yes. Again, uh, you may feel from media, uh, and many people uh, also would agree that um, the way uh, such uh, responsible individuals groups has been identified uh, and uh, the process has been uh, taken uh, the justice uh, uh, process is not properly communicated yeah. and people feel that uh, this government is not protecting the people yeah. enough and they compare this with the previous government uh, which has uh, relatively stronger communication yes. uh, and also uh, maybe it's not inability, but as a way of uh, encouraging inclusiveness, mm -hmm. as a way of uh, bring, you know, giving chance for uh, individuals who are not part of this. Uh, that's the whole thing. Otherwise, I think uh, government is trying its best with a reformed security system, with a reformed uh, police force uh, and justice reform to ensure peace and stability. Okay. So just to be clear, again, you are saying that you do accept to some extent, not necessarily that we need to debate to what extent, but to some extent there is also a responsibility for the government to perform better, to address some of its weaknesses, some of the violations that its forces may have occurred. Is that, is that right? 
Okay. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that we're clear on that. Okay. Great. Well, just on that moment, as I was about to move on to uh, Medema, we have our two other uh, guests who will be joining us in a moment. And while they just get ready, uh, let me just ask you one more question before we turn to them. It's coming back to the economy. You mentioned, and we've heard this phrase, and the Prime Minister has also used this phrase, homegrown reform, homegrown economic reform plan. What exactly about this plan is, is homegrown? What is the uniquely Ethiopian element of this? Because I heard you talk about increased investment. I heard you talk about privatization and giving more room for the private sector. I mean, these are all things that uh, economists all over the world um, encourage or discourage, depending on their own views. Uh, they, I don't hear that as a uniquely Ethiopian um, thing to do. So what, what are the elements of this plan that are homegrown? The fact it makes it homegrown is that um, it starts from what's exactly happened in the country. So given uh, Ethiopia is an agrarian country, wants to pursue industrialization uh, and has opportunities in the tourism mining sector, we want to use our opportunity uh, by bringing more investment and enabling so what it makes it homegrown is it identifies the growth challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it growth diagnostics yeah. has been done. So we are not bringing new just uh, ideas from somewhere and uh, you know, trying to, uh, in the past there were attempts to just copy from, uh, we hear it sometimes from South Korea, developmental state approach or uh, from uh, other countries. So this time, what we have done is, what are the challenges in the country? Yeah. Then reviewing all those challenges, we found out the growth was double digit for nearly two decades uh, before the change. But that growth was fueled mainly because of public investment. Yeah. So that is not sustainable. And uh, took too much borrowing from overseas. Yeah. Uh, so we need to based on our resources to sustainable development, which is unleashing the opportunities uh, and also uh, support the private sector. So what it sounds like to me is that you're describing a plan that is tailored to Ethiopia's circumstances because certainly Ethiopia is not the only country in the world that has a primarily agrarian or agricultural economy. It's certainly not the only country uh, that wants to uh, diversify and industrialize. What, what I'm hearing you say is that the, the plan, whatever the economic plan is, needs to be tailored to the particular circumstances and realities of Ethiopia. But in terms of the responses, whether it's privatization of, you mentioned the industries, you mentioned the opening, uh, you know, whether it's transport or telecoms or what have you, that it sounds to me like the solutions to that are from amongst the ones that we might recognize um, in other countries, but that they may not have been pursued in Ethiopia before. Is that just, fair? Just to give you one simple uh, answer maybe mm -hmm. for that. If you remember the structural adjustment programs uh, that were taken in 80s and be after that, yeah. uh, mainly um, in Africa yeah. uh, and uh, after Cold War uh, in the East uh, Bloc, yeah. in the Eastern Bloc, well, we, you know, most of them were driven by uh, IMF and World Bank. Right. If you do this, we'll give you this. But uh, what happened in Ethiopia is just, this is our plan. Anyone, multilateral or bilateral, could you support us? Yeah. So totally different from what has been achieved. Mm -hmm. So in the case of structural adjustment, after they failed, blamed the financial institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, here now, we are saying, it's our plan, and we know how to do it. So uh, just review what we have you know, planned, uh, and also, uh, if you believe in it, join us. Uh, we are now on the way to prosperity. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ambassador, for holding the fort in the absence of your colleagues. Perhaps we can ask our, our your two colleagues to, to join us on, on stage, and I'll uh, briefly introduce them. So please, please come up, um, if you can.
Well, thank you. Welcome. Um, I know that uh, traffic is still what it is. Dulles is not that close, but thank you for making the journey, the long, long journey from Addis. Um, we've been talking in your absence a little bit about um, the ambassador's experience. Of course, you know very well that he was also uh, um, working in the prime minister's office for some time, and we were just talking a little bit about uh, his own uh, views and some of what he said in his speech. But perhaps we can turn now more to Medimer as the philosophy, which we try to stay away from a little bit, although um, the ambassador said, and we've just been talking about forgiveness, and forgiveness is obviously one of these key concepts in Medimer. So let me just say a few words of introduction and then, and then put uh, questions to you immediately. Lencio Bati is the senior political diplomacy and foreign policy advisor in uh, the office of Prime Minister Abiy. Uh, prior to returning to Ethiopia to rejoin or to join the Abiy administration, uh, Mr. Bati taught human and political geography at Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota. So welcome back to the U.S. And, <laughs> and we also have uh, sitting to uh, your left, uh, Mamo Miretu, who is a uh, senior advisor on policy reforms and chief trade negotiator in the office of the Prime Minister. Um, and you lead uh, the policy and performance team as well in the office of the Prime Minister. Um, so thank you, gentlemen, again for, for coming and for uh, making it here. <laughs> Lencio Bati, if I can turn to you. We've heard... Sorry for interruption, Virgin, yeah. because Ambassador um, was talking um, for most of the time. Yeah. I have just one point to sure. throw before we get into into the main discussion of the Medema. Can, can I come back to you in just a moment? Can okay. I just put a question right. to our... Um, just to be fair to the audience. Yeah, sure. Don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, so, Mr. Bati, if I could come to you and just ask you, what does Medema mean for you? What you uh, may have not heard is the, the ambassador summarized and gave some of the, the excerpts of the speech uh, that the Prime Minister gave in Oslo when he received the, the Nobel Prize. But can you explain to us, when we hear this word, Medimer, and people say synergy, what does that really mean? Like, practically speaking, synergy is one of those words that people like to throw around. Uh, it's one of those buzzwords that, you know, we can find it in a lot of places in this town, for example. What does it really mean? What does it practically mean? Can you, can you help us try and understand that? And then... Um, we'll start from there, and then we'll come back to respond to some of the other issues that have been raised. Uh, thank you. Sorry for uh, being late. Uh, I'm asked to explain uh, the idea behind Madame Mer. Uh, as you all know, every society, every state has a unique history and uh, a unique uh, uh, trajectory. Uh, in Ethiopian case, or in African case, in post-colonial Africa, different form of uh, uh, state building, different form of uh, organizing a society has been tried. By large, there is some success, but when you look at the continent, by large, still, uh, we're struggling with the idea of stateness, we are struggling with the idea of how to uh, hold a society together. In case of Ethiopia, for many, many years, uh, 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 a project that was aimed at creating uh, a national political polity has been tried for many years under different uh, 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 governance during the monarchy, during the Marxist regime, under Marx-Leninist, a uh, different form of ideology has been tried. Since 1991, uh, the federal arrangement has been tried. Uh, all of them, we cannot say they are a failure, but there are some successes, but they still remain inadequate. Ethiopia being one of the oldest nations in Africa, still from time to time, it faces a challenge of stateness. It, it faces challenges of fragmentation. So the prime minister trying to find a way. How can we organize the Ethiopian society? How can we organize our political economy? How can we create a national unity? Out of this, he came up with the idea of madamar. Madamar means it's, in a, it's an idea of national mobilization where we put all our efforts together. And instead of dichromatizing things or instead of just uh, putting things into the extreme, trying to find uh, a common middle ground 
around which we all uh, organize ourselves and build a multinational federal states. This requires uh, mobilizing and bringing together all ethnic groups, all religion, religious uh, sects. At the same time, in the, in, the, in the arena of economy also, it requires uh, creating partnership between private and public also, and also mobilize the entire Ethiopian uh, population. So Madamar means it's a synergy. Uh, it, it, it is a system that looks uh, things from holistic point of view. Uh, usually things has been defined in dichotomous way, either in the left or in the right, or, 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 or with me or against me, all those kind of stuff. But this, this ideology, this thinking, trying to strike a balance between competition and also cooperation. How can we synthesize? How can we synchronize our, 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 our social relations and how we can also organize our economy in, in uh, creating partnership between uh, private and public in the past? Uh, the public has been, uh, a lot of investment has been made in public sphere, but the private uh, 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 investment has been somehow suppressed. This time, we are trying to uh, uh, diminish the role of the state eventually, but still the state still intervene when it's necessary, but we are trying to invite in the private uh, 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 investors and foreign investors in order to uh, 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 put the Ethiopian uh, economy in the right track. Right, so Lencher, while you were away, we actually did talk quite a lot about the economy, so let me press you more on the first part. This idea of synergy, I still don't hear an answer to my question. What does it mean, practically speaking, when we talk about a synergistic approach? I mean, the way the Prime Minister put it in his speech uh, in Oslo was, Medemer signifies synergy, convergence, and teamwork for a common destiny. Those are nice words, but I'm still not clear on what exactly they mean, practically speaking. Well, Medemer has three pillars. One, it's an effort to create, to create a national unity. And second is an effort to make sure citizens of Ethiopia become free and enjoy freedom. Yeah. And third, combine all this, we pursue the path for prosperity. Right. In order to do that, we need to come together. Yeah. Okay, we need to come together, put our efforts together, mm -hmm. and work for common goal. Mm -hmm. Our diversity is a blessing, and uh, we have multinational federation, multinational federation stay. Yeah. It is not a, a, a system or a process of creating a one uh, monolithic national identity. It's, mm -hmm. a it's, it's, it's a way of bringing everything together yes. and create a symbiosis relationship, a relationship that is mutual. Yeah, but mutual, mutual, between, mutual between who exactly? Because when you talk about mutuality of well, agreements. There are different agencies here. Yeah. Society is an agency, religion is an agency, the private sector is an agency, the state is an agency. We, all these things need to be organized and articulated properly in order to bring a desired goal. So the synergy is organizing, coordinating all of this in a synchronized way so that we can achieve our destiny of prosperity. And who makes those decisions about articulating it? When you talk about national unity, for example, you know, we can say on this stage that we have Ethiopians, we can all identify uh, as nationals of that country, but what does national unity practically mean? I mean, what does it mean? Does it mean changing or uh, reinforcing certain symbols? Does it mean changing the nature of the state's political structure? I mean, what does, it, what does this really mean? We talk about national unity as if it's an obvious thing, but I don't think it's so obvious. What does it really mean? Well, national unity, unity means a lot of things. It's an issue of geography. It's an issue of sovereignty and the issues of also uh, citizens' pride. Uh, so when we say national unity in any state, uh, in nation state building project, these are some of the things that you pursue. Uh, some can be, arranged, are, 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 can be managed through governance, through bureaucracy. Some uh, need to also have a national aspiration where people uh, identify themselves with the geography, with a national anthem, with a history, and also common, common destiny. As I said, this problem of issue of Madamer in the first place came, came, came about because we have a problem. Yeah. Okay, we, ha we have a fragmented society. So uh, the Prime Minister thinks this is a means okay, to fix this fragmentation. If you see the, our federation, for example, it's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But this federation is not converging. 
It's not a process of creating a national common political polity. Rather, what you see is a divergent federation in which, in most cases, people really don't share an aspiration of one another, even under one geographic system. So it is, it is a necessary intervention to fix some of the system that is broken. So when you talk about the federal structure, does convergence mean abandoning that, moving no, no, away no, from it? Not. I mean, what does it mean? So this is what I'm trying to understand, practically speaking, that yes, Ethiopia is a federation. You just said that's a step in the right direction, but that there isn't convergence. So help us try to understand, practically speaking, when we talk about Ethiopia as a federal country, what does convergence mean in that particular dimension? It doesn't mean changing somehow, tweaking somehow? I mean, what does it mean? No. Uh, federation is, as I said, the step in the right direction. Yeah. It came about because it was uh, aimed to answer some of uh, pre-1991 tensions, but that federation was mismanaged. It was more of a facade. It was centrally uh, managed. So uh, uh, regions were not free to run their own uh, bureaucracy, to run their own governance. So as such, it has created a lot of conflicts. It had created a lot of tension. That's, 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 that's actually culminated into uh, mass uh, protest and, and, uh, and opposition, and eventually the system has to change. So when we say this federation needs to converge, yeah. as an Ethiopian society, yes. as a people under one state, we have our differences. We also have things that we have in common. We need to emphasize on what we have in common mm -hmm. rather than emphasizing what we have uh, uh, separately. So how do you propose to do that if you're also pursuing um, more federalism? You're saying that effectively the problem was it was too centralized or it wasn't genuine. So that means uh, or implies that there should be more federalism, there should be more decentralization or more autonomy for the regions or however you wish to, to characterize it. So if there's more autonomy or more separation or more decentralization, then how do you come up with this fact that people all identify more together, surely the opposite would happen, or potentially the opposite could happen. Yeah, first of all, federation that is not democratic end up in catastrophe. We have seen that in Eastern Europe. The Ethiopian Federation lacks democracy. So it is necessary to interject a democratic system of governance into Ethiopian Federation, and at the same time allow people to uh, uh, exercise their language and culture, and also use their resources at the same time also unite as a national uh, uh, political society. Um, Etana, let me come to you. You're a historian of Ethiopia. You've heard this argument just being advanced that, yes, Ethiopia is a, federalism, is a federal structure, we need more federalism. I mean, what is your response to that? And if I could ask you to respond specifically to, to this issue of, you know, is Ethiopia, does Ethiopia need more federalism? And if so, what does that mean? Does that permit convergence? Thank you very much for that question because um, the ambassador was talking about this and very honestly to that point, I am very grateful to Ambassador Fussum to have said that um, identity politics is not necessary for Ethiopia when the country's constitution, the existing constitution is about multinational federalism. So when we uh, listen to Lynch Obati, which unfortunately just arrived, the points are very much different. I think Ambassador Fussum was very, very honest in saying that the prime minister and his government is against um, identity politics. It is not necessary. He said, when he explained, he said, peop people must come with ideas, which means um, ideas which are different from mobilization, um, as apart from identity politics. Unfortunately, Lynch Obati is insisting uh, that uh, Ethiopia will pursue uh, and maintain multinational uh, federalism. Having said this, um, Ethiopia adopted multinational federalism um, to come out of a serious problem. Yeah. It's a matter of existing or disintegrating. By 1991, when it was adopted, it was not a matter of joke, or it, it was not even a, a matter of a matter of um, um, creating comfort or any any luxury. It was a matter of keeping the country together, because Ethiopia has a history of national struggle, a civil war, conflicts, um, famine, mm -hmm. 
poverty, all of those things. And that came out of the road Ethiopia traveled in history. Mm -hmm. Imperial Ethiopia, the principles of Imperial Ethiopia did not accept identities of people, cultural identity, um, a religious identity, all sorts of uh, diversity we have in Ethiopia, Imperial Ethiopia rejected those, and that laid into the birth of liberation struggles. Liberation struggle in Tigray, in Oromia, Gambella, including Eritrea. Right, so Eritrea is a product of uh, that policy. So just, so just on this question of so Lenchobati saying we need more federalism, I mean, do you agree with that? Of course, you Ethiopia do. needs more of not just federalism, yes. multinational federalism. Okay. You know, the prime minister and his assistants usually want to skip this kind of uh, a question. They say federalism, but they, they, they are not courageous enough uh, to uh, call about multinational federalism. What, what the country needs to exist, to, to exist and survive this problem is yes. to maintain and promote um, existing multinational pluralism. What Ethiopia requires to survive as a country, as a state, is more federalism, okay. not less. All right. Let me come back to you, Lenchobati, and you, uh, Mama Miretu. When we talk about Medemer, um, and you've described also the problems that Ethiopia has had, there's some shared um, historical analysis there, I think, um, and you're basically describing Medema as a response to that, right? You're saying this is a, it's a way to respond to these things. Um, we've heard, you know, the sort of rhetoric of Medema in terms of coming together and adding together and so on, but I'm still struggling to understand what does it practically mean as a solution? Because I've heard the diagnosis, the diagnosis that Ethiopia is in trouble, that Ethiopia faces many challenges, what is the solution here? I mean, what, when you talk about Medemer as a philosophy or as a platform or as a, as a policy to advance addressing some of these problems, what does it entail on the political front? One of the questions I put uh, to the ambassador a bit earlier is with elections upcoming this year, what practically can the philosophy do or lead to? What reforms can be further affected to improve that environment where you know there is this idea of coming together but also we know elections are competitive and divisive that's the nature of elections if you have people with different points of view so how does medimer really address um, the political space in a practical sense uh, thank you uh, i know ambassador Fizum will not dismiss identity politics uh, i know for sure i know him when he it's was on record <laughs> Uh, Ethiopia is, is, is a diverse nation, you know, since, since its inception. So uh, we have more than 80 ethnic groups. Some of us have multiple identities. We speak different languages uh, because we speak the language of our neighbors, uh, the kids we went to school with. So identity is there. But the issue is identity as a cultural practice, identity as a social practice, and identity as uh, a political instrument to mobilize, there is a lot of debate around that. Probably what that, uh, the ambassador sure. is trying to, to say. As far as the federa federalism is concerned, uh, uh, the, the, the prime minister is a federalist. He believes in federal multi-national uh, 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 federation. He actually struggled within the system against uh, a facade, artificial, form of federalism where a one single ethnic group mastermind even select presidents for other regional states. So accusing him or his uh, administration for being anti-federalism, this is not true. It's very, very, very far from the truth uh, because we know the record. Uh, we know the struggle within the EPRDF. We also know his uh, uh, daily livings. He's a centrist. Uh, he has to, uh, Ethiopia need a leader like him because there are different aspirations. There are two extremes. And uh, oh, the Ethiopian community is highly politicized. Uh, there is a lot of cynicism. So therefore, for him, in order to, uh, to, 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 to uh, uh, maintain the unity of this country and also move it forward, he has to maintain you know, a balance where he can bring everybody you know, on the right direction and uh, move the country forward. Uh, federalism is a constitutional issue. Nobody is going to tamper with that. 
And uh, I mean, uh, anybody who really knows the reality in Ethiopia is not going to really play around with that. So federation okay. is, uh, is going to stay, the prosperity party. One of it is key identity is maintaining multinational federation and how it's going to be practical. Madame Mer believes in inclusive politics. Uh, let me tell you, over the last 27 years, most of the politicians were in jail or either in exile. The journalists were in prison. And uh, 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 the political space was controlled with narrow political oligarchy. Madame the prime minister, released all political prisoners from prison, uh, freed uh, journalists, uh, reformed civil society uh, uh, proclamation, at the same time, also uh, uh, allowed all oppositions, armed and non-armed, to come to the country. He liberalized the entire political space. So right now, the political space is liberalized. That is actually the first stage of uh, reform. Many countries either fail or succeed uh, based on how this opportunity is managed. And the way we see it now, uh, uh, it needs to be uh, handled in a, with, 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 with proper care. The opposition needs to be to, to, to implement a very civil politics. We need to accommodate each other. We need to speak to each other in a very civil way uh, because we have common history, we have common country. There are all challenges, like any other third world country. These are challenges. So uh, in the past, the state was the mother of all the problem. Now I can see the way we are doing our politics is becoming, I'm not blaming a society, but it is becoming a problem. So how to really fix this and move the country forward is what Madame is trying to So, but what, but what is that? Because that's still what I'm trying to understand. When we talk about the second phase, the second phase of that, yeah, the second phase of that reform. Uh, yeah. Maybe, and maybe uh, Mama wants to come in on this to, to respond as well. Please feel free. But yes, we know people have been released. We know that the opposition parties are, are working. I'm still trying to understand, and I think the audience would like to also understand, when we talk about the second phase of reform, when we talk about practically preparing um, you know, for a more inclusive politics, as you put it, what does that actually mean? I mean, inclusive politics is one of those phrases that also sounds nice, but in practice, what does it, what does it mean beyond the bare ability of parties yeah. to function? M yeah, Madame is actually much richer than inclusive politics. This is what has been prescribed from somewhere else in the past. Madame is homegrown idea. We have our differences. Uh, we can maintain our differences, but we have common needs. As human beings, we have a common needs because we have to meet our daily needs. As a citizens of uh, a country, we need to maintain our national unity. As a people, we need to get out of this poverty and move forward and achieve prosperity. These are the three things. We have been talking about poverty for many, many years. When you talk about something again, 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 it becomes your friend. That's why we are trying to avoid the word poverty now. We, now, that's why we adopted the word prosperity. We're dreaming big. All right. um, Mama, you wanted to come in. Maybe you can try and respond to this question of, okay, it's more than inclusive politics. We understand that. It's a broader idea. You don't want to talk about poverty. Fair enough. Um, although we all know that Ethiopia's uh, poverty has declined over the last in conjunction with economic growth, but there's still a problem of poverty in the country, definitely. So what is... Medimer in a practical sense, when we talk about coming together, when we talk about opposition parties functioning, is Medimer more than a slogan for the prosperity party? Well, definitely it's more than a slogan. Uh, I think you keep asking what Medimer is again and again, but I think you, you, you can look at it in three ways, okay. uh, in my view. I think the first is, you know, the literal definition of the word itself, Medimer. Yeah. It means coming together, you know, working for the, uh, the same purpose or shared purpose. Uh, working in sync. That's the literal definition of Medemer. Uh, but I think it goes beyond this literal definition of the word. Uh, I think the first thing is Medemer can be seen as a set of ideas that guides the reform process in Ethiopia right now. So if you look at, for example, the book that was authored by the Prime Minister, um, there is a general discussion of what Medemer is, and then it offers a set of ideas when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the direction of the politics, when it comes to Ethiopia's foreign relations. So it has a set of ideas, really good ideas, for how to guide 
how to shape the reform process that's currently happening. So, so one way of looking at it is it's a set of really good ideas that transform the country towards prosperity. So that's one element of it. The second element of Medemer is you can see it as a framework, as, as, as a way of looking at things, as, as a lens through which you examine things. Uh, you know, so essentially what Medemer says is uh, it's a call to the nation to extricate this habit of, this dangerous uh, habit of throwing uh, the past and starting with a clean slate all the time. So that needs to be uh, stopped. What Medemer says is instead of starting afresh every time, you build on the successes and the gains of the past, number one. Number two, you identify mistakes of the past and try to correct them. And number three, try to be observant. Try to really examine the current reality and identify the problems and come up with a solution that responds to our current reality. So it's a framework of uh, looking at things as well. So viewed through, the, through this lens, you can actually say, what would be the policy of the government when it comes to the economy? What's the policy of the government when it comes to the foreign relations? Looking at it as a framework of uh, uh, look, uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the goal of Medemer is to achieve shared prosperity for the Ethiopian people. Ultimately, the goal of Medemer is to leave a legacy of hope for the next generation. So we look at the past, and instead of throwing it away, we see what you know, lessons that we can take from that, correct past mistakes, and build a bright future for the next generation. Okay. Ultimately, that's, that's what Medemer all is right. all about. Thanks very much. That's helpful. Maybe we can move on a little bit from uh, this to talk a bit more about foreign policy. You've just mentioned that time is, is running. The African Union Summit just happened in Addis uh, last week. When you walked around Addis, you could see the billboard saying Medema for a prosperous Africa. This is uh, emblazoned on the African Union Summit uh, billboards. What does Medema mean when you say it's a framework for understanding action? Yes. What does it mean when we talk about foreign policy? And let's perhaps start with the, the region. So we, we're all very much aware of the achievements that have occurred. So let's not dwell on what's been done, but let's try and understand what does it mean practically speaking. So, you know, as we know right now, Ethiopia is engaged in these sensitive talks about the Nile, uh, with Egypt, with Sudan, without going into the details of that, obviously it's sensitive and still a negotiation that's ongoing. But can you explain to us, for example, how Medema, when we talk about cooperation or coming together, how would that play out in this very practical and very real case where it matters, right? The outcome matters to all the countries involved. It particularly matters to uh, Ethiopia. So what does it mean when we talk about Medema in a regional foreign policy context? And maybe we can start with the, the water issues and then perhaps we can broaden out a little bit. I, I think, uh, uh, first of all, I mean, when it comes to uh, the negotiation regarding GERD, this is, as you said, uh, a very sensitive issue, and I would avoid making any comment on that particular topic. Yeah, at this I mean, particular I mean I'm, I'm not asking you to go into details. I'm just saying in terms of the approach when we talk about it, right? I mean, the principle, if we look at the Prime Minister's speech, is cooperation, friendship, right? And that presumably goes for the neighboring countries as well, yes. including ones which may not have the same interests as Ethiopia. Yes. So I'm just trying to understand what it means, practically speaking, yes. as so, a so, so I, th I think, uh, absolutely. So if you look at the Medemer conception, you can actually make a you know, really strong connection about Ethiopia's foreign policy priority when it comes to Africa. Because Medemer essentially focuses on our shared humanity. It focuses on our shared objectives. So it doesn't really wish away our differences. It actually cherish our, cherishes our uh, uh, differences. Yeah. So when it comes to African continent, for example, Ethiopia wants to play a purposeful, purposeful role, an active role, to actually bring together all African nations. A very good example of this is the role that Ethiopia played in finalizing and negotiating the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. This is a clear example of past work, legacy, that we inherited from our forefathers, you know, and creating an integrated Africa would create the basis for a prosperous Africa. And Ethiopia plays a very active and a very purposeful role in that regard. The African, for, as an example, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement becomes a reality when Ethiopia ratifies the agreement. Without Ethiopia, the agreement will never be uh, come to existence. It's come to, into existence because of what Ethiopia did. Ethiopia brought close to 100 million uh, people 
to this single African market. So this is sort of a natural extension of our domestic policy. We support, we promote coming together domestically, and a natural you know, kind of mirror image of that would be to support further integration uh, effort in the African continent as well. So does, so does that mean, uh, I'll give you in a moment, but I just want to ask this question in response to that. Does this mean that effectively it's a sort of pan-Africanist idea? I mean, that where we've seen, you know, in the past, whether it's Kwame Nkrumah or even Haile Selassie articulating this sort of pan-Africanist uh, vision, is that a fair way of characterizing it? Maybe, uh, Lencho, you want to respond to that? To just add a little bit on what Mamo said, uh, how Madame Mer applies in our uh, foreign policy activities. Uh, for example, we we promote uh, regional integration, regional economic integration in the Horn. The reason is uh, Ethiopia is the heart of the Horn of Africa, and also Ethiopia shares uh, 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 borders. At the same time, uh, we also share communities. They are Oromos in Ethiopia, Oromos in Kenya, they are Tigrims in Tigray, they are Tigris in Eritrea, there are Fars in Ethiopia, Fars in, in Djibouti and also in Eritrea. Uh, uh, we have Somalis in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in Somalia, sure. Somaliland, in Djibouti. Mm -hmm. The same with uh, 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 Anuak, the same with Nuer. So therefore, we share geography, we also share uh, 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 cultural groups. So therefore, uh, we can say our, our, our faith is interlinked. So Madame Mar is interlinking things. Instead of, we don't believe in particularizing things. We are trying to create a synergy for everything. We, we, we believe it will work. Because uh, human beings, as, as Mamo said, have similar interest. Nation also can have similar interest. I don't know any nation who really wants to condemn itself to underdevelopment. Everybody wants to move forward. So in this, we, we can pull our efforts together. We can also uh, 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 use our natural endowments and work for the betterment of the whole region. For Ethiopia also, it's a larger economy. It's 100, uh, 110, 108 million people. It's landlocked. It is a primary economy, agricultural economy. We need ports. All these countries around us are ports. So therefore, even for our own interest, for our economic interest, we give priority to our neighbors. We don't have any enemies. We don't start from labeling somebody or some nation as an enemy. We start everybody as our neighbor. <laughs> then we move forward. So what you've described in some sense is you know, basic political interest, right? That Ethiopia needs access to ports. Ethiopia needs uh, to have good relations where it has shared ethnic groups and so on. Um, two questions, one is, isn't that always sort of what the interests have been? I mean, the ports may change, and that uh, may still change, but w where is the, the key difference uh, in that? Yeah. But if I can just uh, add a second question to that and coming back to this idea of beyond the border regions, right? Obviously, you're right. There are these areas where through history, colonialism, the way that uh, land was uh, allocated, you have groups split between several different countries. But beyond that, in terms of when it's emblazoned on the African Union banner as Medema for a prosperous Africa. What does that mean if you are, say, Nigeria? What does that mean if you are Zambia um, from the perspective of Medema and this sort of idea that it's beyond boundaries? I mean, what should those countries understand and by extension, countries further afield mm. as well? Yeah, one uh, important concept in this Medema is uh, it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, it believes in symmetry, means balancing. It believes in competition. At the same time, it also believes in cooperation. So this is, this, is, this is how our foreign policy is going to be guided. We do not pursue a foreign interest. It is not because it is our right. It is because we need it. For example, the Nile. I mean, most of, I mean, the, the majority of the rivers uh, uh, comes from Ethiopia. We are not raising a, a issue of rights. We are raising the issue of needs. We only use what we need. It is, no, it is not about we use what is ours. We don't pursue that kind of, we just use what we need because we need it. And when we do that, we also make sure others do not get hurt or others' uh, 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 livelihood is not affected. 
What about where needs or interests conflict? I mean, Ethiopia has its needs, other countries well, define their needs well. As well, this is old uh, international relation politics. We want to pursue a different one, and we believe it will work. Uh, in, uh, yeah, as you are right, it's a pan-African sense, and uh, we are humans of this globe, and our life shouldn't always be fueled by right. throat-cutting competition. Okay. What about for the other countries on the on the continent? Like I said, if you're thinking about this from a further perspective, you mentioned, uh, Mama mentioned the uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. So that's obviously a, a tangible expression of that. It incorporates or hopes to incorporate almost every country on the continent. If you are not an immediate neighbor of Ethiopia, what does the new foreign policy mean for you? What if you are as I said, you know, Nigeria or Zambia or the Central African Republic or you name it. I mean, what is the expectation? Is there a general orientation that we can see coming out of this that other countries should expect or should know? I mean, whoever wants to respond to that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Medamer, you know, essentially, as I said, uh, if you look at Medamer's foreign policy priority, in the African continent, we want to promote integration. Yeah. We want to uh, create a bigger market within the African continent. When that happens, it will benefit not just Ethiopia, but the rest of Africa, whether it is Nigeria or South Africa or Guinea, or whichever country that you mentioned, will benefit from that. It's, it's just simple, uh, simple uh, economics. When you create a bigger market, you will be, you'll be able to attract investment because investors will come and invest not just in one particular country but in all countries knowing that they can freely trade across the African yeah. continent and this would be an important contribution for shared prosperity yeah. not just in Ethiopia but also in Nigeria okay. uh, so what we really want to do is the Prime Minister often talks about markets that are open to trade and uh, minds that are open to ideas yeah. that's a common uh, you know phrase that he often repeats in his speech. You know, his, his idea is for, it, for an Ethiopian living in, in Addis, can go and work in Lagos, for example. That kind of closer integration would benefit everyone. Yeah, sure, please, Ambassador. Just uh, to add a little bit on this, uh, what it is is uh, we are saying it's better together. It's better our way than uh, my way or your way. Uh, so uh, it's not just a simple uh, concept uh, when you see uh, our politicians or many people in the country, even uh, the uh, intellectuals, uh, you find uh, a kind of orthodox or conservative kind of my way kind of uh, attitude. Uh, staying for the last 10 months, uh, 9 months here in the U.S., I've learned you compromise a lot. Mm -hmm. I think this is a wonderful, uh, I mean, wisdom to go forward. We hardly do that. So, <laughs> Medemar is uh, bringing this kind of infusion, this kind of uh, bringing a way to work together. Yeah. So, what you see, what we are trying to achieve in the Nile negotiation, is also what can we achieve together? Yeah. Because uh, it's better together again. Mm -hmm. And when you bring this into the African uh, uh, you know, continent, intercontinental uh, free trade agreement is one of them, but that's not all. Uh, we have what we call uh, 2063 uh, AU African Union agenda, which has many issues to bring Africa together to, to create common uh, market to create a common, you know, uh, African to, to unite Africa. So uh, I think uh, the African Union team and what is coming out as Medemer has more uh, of uh, one and you know uh, same uh, in many ways. Uh, it aligns uh, easily to the African agenda as well. Uh, I think uh, we have done so much. Uh, in the past saying this is my way and that's how I should be pursuing. But politicians, be it opposition or government, uh, other institutions all have to come to listen to others and see how much they can compromise for the betterment of the nation, for the betterment of the country.
So what you're describing is not only, of course, uh, an international uh, precept, this my way, your way, you're also describing it in a, in a domestic context. But you know, listening is one thing, right? We can all listen or you can invite people to listen and exchange views and dialogue, and that's something that is obviously very important. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a, a compromise that results in it. I mean, even on this panel, there are different points of view, right? Um, how is it more than just about dialogue or just about hearing the other people? How is it possible, uh, particularly for those that aren't in power or don't have the benefit of being in office? It's always easier for those that do have the power and do have uh, the stronger position to say there should be compromise. It's much more difficult when you are you know, in a weaker position to, to be equanimous in that way. So what does it really imply at a practical level for your average Ethiopian? I mean, if we're talking about somebody today, forgetting about the high politics and whatever else is going on amongst the political parties, if you are an average Ethiopian citizen living in Ethiopia, what does this mean for you? So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just referring to the Medamer book, unfortunately the English version is not yet until next month, uh, will be coming out. Uh, so, uh, just referring to that Medamer is uh, about uh, clearing the past through forgiveness and coming into uh, a new term. And then to know one another, yeah. to work together. In the past 40 years or so, politicians were divided mm -hmm. and uh, accusing each other. Right. And uh, they have never been met. But what about in the ordinary person? person? I mean, not I'm, I'm talking about yeah. the ordinary people as well because or the politicians... Uh, you know, they are the one, uh, they coin ideas that divide or unite people. Mm. So those who are receptive of these ideas yeah. have never met because they believe they are in a different world uh, and uh, have been, I said, uh, in the U.S. Uh, meeting uh, more than 20,000 diaspora in 22 cities in just nine months. Mm. And in many of the meetings, I met people coming to the meeting for the first time together. They met as this community or that community or the other community, not as the Ethiopian community together. So whenever some ideas were raised, the other was saying, I didn't know that you think this way. So we have never met, introduced each other, worked together. So I think that's a process that we should be encouraging people to know each other, what they are thinking, what they believe, and also help them to know each other and compromise to come to center because ultimately we have to build what we call our nation. Okay. Yeah. Mama Lancho, do you want to add to, to this? I want to put the same question to you and I also want to put it to you in a moment, Etana, as well. This idea for the individual, again, you know, the political thing, the diaspora is perhaps not the majority of the people we're talking about here. The 100 million Ethiopians are mostly in Ethiopia. So what is the individual consequence or the individual implication when the prime minister makes these uh, rhetorical flourishes to come together and to you know, promote this idea of oneness? What does it mean for your average person? Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, it's, 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 it's beyond uh, rhetoric or pledge. It's happening actually in actual practicality. Uh, I have never seen in my life that the Ethiopian Grand Palace ever opened to its citizens with this uh, magnitude and uh, 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 openness. This is the palace in Addis you're talking about? Right now, yes. There is a lot of dialogue going on. Uh, b between him and the opposition, opposition leaders, and among the opposition itself. He also formed border commission, he formed a uh, peace and reconciliation commission. Uh, there is also an Oromo and Amhara elites uh, forum going on because there is uh, the, the two, two, two uh, uh, states exhibit uh, 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 tension. So th the actual dialogue is happening. How are we going to use it? Uh, is 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 uh, what is a test? So the opening is there. Uh, 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 we, the, we 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 are going to election. We want to make sure you know uh, everybody get a fair level playing field. 
and uh, let the Ethiopian people decide whom they want as their leaders. So there is massive commitment from the Prime Minister and his administration in terms of making this election free and fair and democratic and credible also. That's very important because the credibility of state and the state society relation depends on the outcome of that election. That's where if, if, if we succeed with liberalization, we are struggling because the field is open and the way the politics is being played, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, we have, you know, 70% of the Ethiopian youth population are youth. So there is challenge, but the commitment is there. So if we uh, manage to have a free and fair elections with credible result, then we can see a positive identification of uh, people with the state. Then we can say we can achieve, we, are, we are really transform the Ethiopian states. So two things. One, we want to transform the state. Yeah. At the same time, we also want to bring democracy to the country. There is two challenges. So this election is not just a normal election. It's, it's actually a referendum, mm -hmm. whether to, to, to live together or not. So it's a very complicated uh, situation. And uh, the, the prime minister is quite aware of this. He's working very hard. He's dialoguing with all the oppositions. For example, you know, the election board is chaired by a woman who is a victim of torture, who was also a very famous political figure at one time. 50% of the, 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 the cabinets are women, so the commitment is there. Okay. So uh, it also requires, as Mamo said, how we, the Ethiopian people, play this chance mm -hmm. in order to move our country and transit into democratic governance. Okay. Um, maybe we'll just turn to Etana, just in the interest of time. I just want to ask you to respond to this uh, idea of what does it mean for an individual? You've heard the aspirations, some of the aspirations that remain, some of the things that have been done. But if we're talking about an individual citizen, what do you hear? What's your reaction to what you've heard here? Just briefly, please. Um, I think you'll be fair on me as well. <laughs> um, uh, f for lunch or opening the Grand Palace for visit for ordinary uh, citizens or uh, urban dwellers is a reform. Um, but I haven't reflected on Madame itself because uh, what is going on in the country tells much a lot than the rhetoric of the Prime Minister and his allies about Madame. Madame is not something that is yet to be put in practice. It is already practiced since um, April 2018, when the Prime Minister came to office. What Madamer meant, we have seen through his choices. We have seen it through his decisions. We have seen through his rhetorics. We have seen it through a number of political decisions that have happened in Ethiopia. So if you give me just two uh, minutes, I want to reflect on that and come to what it means for an individual or ordinary citizens uh, in, in, well, in well let's, let's come to the individual right away, just because we're running out of time. I want to, to hear this But I haven't idea. reflected on Madamer itself. I haven't said well, anything briefly, about Madamer. Just briefly. One, yeah. in the first place, the claim that Madamer is a philosophy is baseless. It is not uh, a philosophy. Madamer is not a philosophy. The book itself, the book itself, the Prime Minister's book, uh, which has just uh, been published, did not call Madamer a philosophy. I think my colleague, I mean, uh, the ambassador and other um, uh, workers of the prime minister have, have got a chance uh, to see um, at least forward of the book. It says um, this is uh, an idea. Yeah. It is not a philosophy. Well, that's, that's, a, one. that's a minor it, point, it, let's it, say, right? It, it's, I mean. it, it's a minor point, yeah. but um, um, we have to take it into, uh, okay, into what, account. What is the impact for an individual? I mean, this, I want to get to the heart of the matter. You can critique the concept but you've heard one articulation for uh, what it could be for Ethiopian citizens. I want to know if you see that vision, if you agree with that, or if you see it a different way. Do you see life changing for, for your average person as a result of this idea? Madamer is an old rhetoric. It's just a return of the outworn and exhausted word unity okay. that have been used for long. It's not a new thing. Okay. We have in Ethiopia today, we have in Ethiopia today, mm -hmm. a prime minister who just 
so the referendum that had happened in a particular place in, in the south, that is Sidama, yeah. and failed to recognize that the people has decided to have a separate statehood. Unfortunately, Lynch said he is a federalist. If the prime minister is a federalist, what is his problem with Sidama? Why we have got 69 people killed in less than a week if the, if the uh, prime minister is a federalist? If the prime minister is a federalist, what is a problem um, uh, with um, reorganizing the southern nations and nationalities um, into, uh, into separate states? So, so the point is, the point is, the prime minister is in a process of dissolving Ethiopia's multinational federalism. That is what is unfolding in Ethiopia. One basic question, one basic question, why has Ethiopia experienced all of this violence since the prime minister came to power? A type of violence that Ethiopia has never seen in recent decades. Why have we got people evicted in hundreds of thousands after the prime minister came to office? A prime minister uh, who is a peace laureate, a prime minister who is praised to be democratic, a prime minister who is praised to be including women into his cabinet, but why Ethiopia hasn't got a peace when we are saying the prime minister is a, a man of peace? The answer to the question is what the prime minister is doing to stay in power. A prime minister manipulating security structure, intelligence structure, administrative structure, dissolving the old, um, uh, systems that kept the country together, that kept people safe, in order to expand cracks, in order to create problems, expand conflicts, and declare a state of emergency state on power. The southern nations and nationalities is under a state of emergency right now. The western provinces of Ethiopia are under a state of emergency. The parliament knows nothing about this thing. So for ordinary citizen, Medemer is a hell. Okay. I'll give you the chance to respond to some of that in a moment, because uh, I think it's, it's important that they respond. But just, just in a I'll give you a chance in a moment. But I do want to uh, allow, while we still have a few minutes left, uh, we have time, I think, only for one question from this side and one question from this side. Um, I'm sorry, people, but that's, uh, that's how it is. So let's um, just have a question. Please ask a question. Please be concise, and please tell us who you are. So um, one gentleman here, please. Or lady, there's a microphone just behind you there. Yeah, thank you. You'll, I, I'll, I'll uh, give you the chance to respond to uh, these comments um, in your response there, but I want to hear one question from here, please. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for being here. Uh, uh, I'm glad that uh, you have focused on Madamer itself. Uh, in reality, for the citizens of Ethiopia right now, uh, who are uh, moving from conflict, crisis to crisis to crisis, uh, since Abi is coming, uh, what we are sensing is a hijacked uh, chain. Do you, do you have a question, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. So, please ask uh, a question. How is Madamer in any way related to uh, the millions of Oromo youth who have gone out and put their life in danger uh, you know, to bring about change because of land grab that is taking away their private property. Okay, thanks. And that their private property, personal property, is taken away, usurped by government uh, for the enrichment of the elite, and that has never stopped. It, in fact, has been expanded. Okay, in. thank you. Uh, and we'll take one question here. Um, if there is the gentleman just here. Uh, my question is uh, why the government is letting those people who committed this atrocity to the people of Ethiopia. I know Madamar is uh, a principle of bringing people together, but if we see really literally, a very few people, people are agitating the community to create this kind of atrocity everywhere. Why the government is letting these people do these things? I think that solution can be resolved with a few people coming inside and fixing this problem. Those are the people who are causing all this problem in every part of Ethiopia. 95% of the Ethiopian population is peaceful when they live together and been living together for 1,000 years. I know there are problems of all the back thing, the history and everything, 
That's the philosophy of Medemaris, bringing these people together so we can find a solution. And instead of staying on the blame game okay. and continue fighting again. So why yeah. the government is letting these people do whatever they want right. and get out of without any problem? Thank this you. is my Thank question. You. Thanks. So um, a few issues that have been raised, if I could ask you to, to respond to them. Um, we have this idea of the question that has been raised in relation to land issues and some of the grievances perhaps of the Oromo community, why the government is not doing more. But I also would like you to respond in general, if you could, as a summary remark to the critique that you've heard that Medemer isn't uh, delivering, isn't actually making things worse for some people, how you respond to that. Uh, we'll start with Lencho and then we'll come to Mamo um, thereafter. All right. Um, <coughs> uh, first of all, uh, in uh, 18, 19 months in office, what the Prime Minister have done is uh, something that takes a minimum 10 years to do. The speed, the commitment, and the change also. Uh, we know Ethiopia, Ethiopia was hell for the under uh, uh, previous uh, uh, administration for 27 years. There are a lot of people still unaccounted for, including my brother. My brother spent 10 years under the dirk. He was released. Few months again, he was detained by TPLF. His whereabouts is still not known. My mom died. Every time somebody knocks the door, my mom said, open the door, maybe he's my son. She died with that pain. This is not only a single story. It's a multiple story. We know where some of these questions, from which corner it comes from. Uh, this prime minister tried to be inclusive. He believed in forgiveness. There are some who are really suffering from self-imposed isolation. Okay, the opportunity is there to, 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 to participate. The opportunity is there to, to, to play their role, but if really they want to do what they have been doing for the last 27 p years, it open people said no. So therefore, uh, the, 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 this prime minister, he freed the country. Yes, the open people freed itself, but he is a leader who can really move this country forward. So therefore, uh, I hear from uh, my, my brother uh, that uh, uh, atrocities continue, human rights continue. I've been, I spent more than half of my life struggling for change. I know all this. And I'm not going to put myself in a situation where if things are not promising. I see things on the ground. I returned to Ethiopia after 31 years in exile. I was a fighter too for that matter. <laughs> so therefore, there is a change on the ground. So recycling this old rhetoric from distance is not going to solve Ethiopia's problem. Okay. Thanks. Mamo, if, if I can ask you to try and respond to some of these uh, critiques that have been offered. I, I understand that uh, we want to articulate or you want to articulate a, a positive vision, but I think it's important if you can try and engage with some of the, the critiques that have been offered. I mean, why is the government not doing more, for example, is, is one important question. I, I think because I don't have, uh, you know, I only have a few minutes, but let me just quickly say, sure. I think this comment, this uh, in voodoo analysis, that Madame is hell is just laughable. If you want to see, if you want to see the record of the prime minister, all you have to do is just read the news. You know, this is a prime minister who has achieved significant reform in a very limited period of time, and the international committee has recognized it. The Nobel Committee has recognized it. So it's just, it's just for me, it's just mind blowing. You know that you know people, uh, how far they can go to twist things for a political purpose. I think that's not right, and that doesn't help productive and purposeful uh, uh, discourse. But let me just say two things. I think the first thing is yes. You know, uh, we need we acknowledge that we need to do better and more when it comes to maintaining law and order. You know, on that point, we absolutely agree. And I'm sure soon enough you will see some positive developments in terms of the government taking additional concrete steps to maintain law and order in Ethiopia. <laughs> but as, as, as a point, as a final point on my part, because this uh, session is about Medemer, let me just say this. Medemer focuses on our common humanity. It focuses on our shared culture 
and history. That's what the Medemir is all about. It sees the Ethiopians in all of us, but at the same time, it respects and cherishes our diversity. It doesn't ignore our diversity. It respects our diversity, but at the same time, it recognizes our common humanity and shared objectives. But ultimately, the path of Medemir, the framework of Medemir, and Medemir as a political vision and conception will take this country to the inevitable destiny of prosperity. And, and let me just say this. When we think about prosperity in Ethiopia, we have a sort of expansion, uh, sort of wider perspective on prosperity. It's not just about economic growth. It's also about respecting the fundamental rights of the individual. So that's where the individual comes in. It's also about respecting the freedom and liberty of the individual. It's also about, it's also about fostering equality. So prosperity in the context of Medemir should be understood broadly not just economic growth, but respect for equality and respect for uh, uh, political liberty at the same time. Thank you very much. And on that note, we will have to leave it there. I'm sorry we didn't have uh, more time. Alas, Ethiopian Airlines uh, flight times are not, uh, beyond, uh, not in our control. But please join me in thanking our panelists, Lencho Bati, Mama Moretu, Fitzmarega, and Etana Dinkab.